Hello, welcome back to Book Nerd TV. As you are well aware, the Booktube Prize is an ongoing process that's going to culminate in October of this year, 2020. And in order to get to the final awarding of the prize, we've had to go through, I think it was initially 96 or 98 books. The Octafinals cut that down to, I think, 46, 48 books so that each group was assigned six books. I was assigned to group A, if I'm not mistaken, and the books assigned to group A were Know My Name by Chanel Miller, Underland by Robert McFarlane, The Body by Bill Bryson, Anarchy by William Dalrymple, Labyrinth of Ice by Buddy Levy, and A Woman of No Importance by Sonia Purnell. The octafinals ended at the end of March, and of the six books ranked one to six, the top three vote getters would proceed to the next round or the quarterfinals. All of that has already taken place, so my disclosure of the rankings that I had affects absolutely nothing. You just get to find out which books I enjoyed the most out of the six books that I read from Group A. The book I ranked number six, or my least favorite book in Group A, was The Anarchy by William Dalrymple. The Anarchy was an interesting book on a lot of levels and I'm gonna put the book down because as you can see it's a little chunky. The Anarchy was interesting on a lot of levels because it it gave me an interesting peek into the fall of the Mughal Empire. What I feel the book did not give me was a great deal if any insight into what the book is supposedly about, which is the East India Company, this corporation based in England, Britain, Great Britain, how they as a company decided to take over this, this failing empire. The empire, the Mughal Empire was in the process of disintegrating for various and sundry reasons. A lot of internal reasons, but a lot of external reasons from these outside forces, mainly the British, also the French. Dalrymple gives us a great deal of information about this, the Shah Alam, which I guess was the actual last emperor of the Mughal Empire. A lot about him, a lot about him. But what we don't really get in the book about the East India Company is the machinations of the East India Company as a corporation. And so we do get the description of the agents acting on behalf of the East India Company coming in, taking over, sort of engaging in this sort of uh, divide and conquer sort of, of politics, supposedly acting as allies, but double dealing the people that they're supposedly backing, you, raising these sort of mercenary armies to take over the Indian subcontinent. And once they've taken over the Indian subcontinent, or as they're in the process of taking over the Indian subcontinent, they, of course, extract all of the wealth. What we don't get a great deal of is how the East India Company becomes feared within Great Britain. We get some hints of it, but we don't get a lot of, 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 of what they do in England, only that they become this entity and at some point basically too big to fail and have to be propped up by the English government. Dalrymple kept telling us how this small company uh, with no more than seven or 11 members or board members or whatever it was who actually ran the company, how this small group of people took over an entire subcontinent. And that is what I thought I was going to get, sort of who were these people how did this company manage to, how did this corporation manage to get away with this sort of um, pillaging and plundering of an entire subcontinent, right? And, and raise an army on this subcontinent to rival any army in India. And, and why, why wasn't England the government and the monarchy more concerned about 
the, the conquering and colonialism and pillaging of this subcontinent. We don't get, we don't get anything like that, but we do get um, the fractious relationships between this emperor and this prince and then his cousin and then his daughter. We get all that stuff on the, on the Indian and the Mughal side, which again was interesting, but I did not think was the point of this book. I thought it was supposed to be about the East India Company and it ended up being about what agents of the East India Company did as the Mughal Empire was falling to enrich themselves and enrich the East India Company and enrich Great Britain and enrich their shareholders. The writing seemed to have a textbook or Encyclopedia Britannica style to it. I still managed to slog my way through the, what, 350 to almost 400 pages of actual text because there was about 150 pages of notes and glossary. You needed a glossary to remember who was who. It was, it was, it was, it was number six. And that's all I have to say about that. My number five was The Body by Bill Bryson. The Body was an interesting tour around uh, the human body, as it were. I understand that Bill Bryson is a celebrated nonfiction writer. Uh, I understand that he's supposed to have this sort of real witty way of writing. He brings a sense of humor and interest to his subjects. Not really sure what happened with the body because I just wasn't, it, it did not work for me on hardly any level. <laughs> and I can't even say that the book was poorly written because it was not. I do the, uh, his attempts at humor, I just found not humorous, <laughs> I guess. I just was not, this was not the book. I, I don't even have a lot to say about this book like I did the anarchy. The anarchy failed me on a lot of levels. This book just didn't even it was just a book I read. It was interesting. And if you like Bill Bryson, you'll probably enjoy this book. For me, number five. Book number four for me was Underland. Beautiful cover. Beautiful cover. Okay, so not only do I love the cover of Underland, it's just, it's gorgeous. I enjoyed the first third of Underland. Um, the writing... The writing in the first third where he's really sort of getting us into the book and introducing the underland itself was, was poetic, lyrical, just so, just so descriptive and it just, he just painted for you. Well, he painted for me the picture of the underland. I could see where he was because he just gave us such beautiful, lyrical, flowery descriptions of the landscape and the, the interior of the earth. I loved the first third of this book. It was great. The second part of the book where he's underground in um, Paris, and he's underground. I think it's somewhere in Italy. I didn't, I, I didn't get it. I, I, I got nothing from it. So maybe other people got something from his escapades in the underground in France. I got nothing. The last part, and I'll say the last third, when he's in Greenland, his visit to Greenland was a callback to another book I read in this in this group A, uh, Labyrinth of Ice. Because in Labyrinth of Ice, they're in Greenland. So this is in the 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s. Well, actually there in the late 1800s. And... Um, to have McFarlane describing at least a little bit of Greenland now 
for me juxtaposed with the Greenland that was described in um, the Labyrinth of Ice in the 1800s was just a, a sort of a nice callback for me. McFarland does discuss sort of the environmental challenges being faced. Again, the first third really sold me. The second and third parts, the next two thirds of the book really, really didn't do anything for me. But I would recommend that you read Underland, however, because the first third is just so glorious. And I think that you'll continue with the second and the third parts of the book because it's not a bad book. It's just that the first part was so amazing that for me, the next two thirds just kind of pale in comparison.